Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I want to ha- introduce myself so that you know who you're listening to or watching. Uh, my name is Corey Johnston. I'm a laborer in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. I grew up between a family farm and a small community of about 10,000 people, and I eventually moved to a small city of about 230,000 people. Most of the people here are conservative and right-wing with many that would be considered far right. I'm different from that. I'm an anarcho-communist, an atheist, and a skeptic. This means that I try to follow ideas that are better for everyone, uh, but I also try to base those ideas on the best evidence available. As an anarchist, I believe that all people are equal and deserve to be treated as such. Uh, No one is above another, and systems that put people above each other in value are not systems that I can endorse. When you hear anarchists talk about hierarchy, this is what they mean. As a communist, I believe that everyone is entitled to a good life and all things belong to all. There is nuance to this, but above all, it entitles everyone to a safe and good life free from coercion. As an atheist, I am agnostic. It's not just that I don't believe in any god or gods, but I also believe that the claims people make about the god or gods they believe in are inconsistent and often incoherent. My anarchist tendencies mean I try not to judge others for believing things that aren't true or evidence-based, but with my mix of tendencies, I do also try to help people reach the best ideas and come to the best conclusions for everyone, rather than just supporting the status quo or being purely self-interested. I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now. I started with the atheist and skeptic communities in 2013, though I eventually moved on to more progressive communities and spaces as the toxicity and reactionary tendencies in skeptic spaces became more apparent. I do believe that a good skeptic will land on libertarian or anarchist ideals, but nobody who follows the evidence can say that capitalism is good for the world or humanity. I've only been working with video for a couple of years, and I hope that my channel can grow and build a community like some of those I've seen around other channels. However, I don't live online. I have children, a partner, a job that is demanding, and an aging parent who sometimes needs my help. This means my schedule for production is inconsistent. I hope that you will bear with me and that you enjoy my work. I have many ways that you can support this channel, and I always have other projects on the go. So look in the show notes or description box to check those out as well. My Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me through any social media platform or by email at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. In this episode, I talked to Andy from the Poor Proles Almanac, and before I send you to it, I want to thank my newest patron, who hasn't had a shout-out yet, Phaedrus. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Now on to the interview. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Andy from the Poor Proles Almanac. Hey, Corey. How you Thanks doing? Thanks for joining me. Good. <laughs> Good. How are you doing? Not too bad. Uh, sorry, your video is like a couple seconds behind your audio. Uh, oh. <laughs> so it's like throwing me off a little bit. I thought you were done talking. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I'm try- I'm still working on the details of that because it happens every time now. <laughs> Love technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure why it started doing that. It's great. <laughs> I've been there. It's I'm I'm basically a Luddite, and every time someone's like, "Oh, you guys need to do this and that with technology," I'm like, "You're asking someone that wants to like play with rocks. This is the wrong person." <laughs> I I don't mind playing with the technology, but who has the time to learn all these new things, right? Like, see, I just I try to read the things like when it describes like how to like manipulate various like code or whatever, and it just I glaze over. I'm just like, nope. Oh, yeah. got nothing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I guess for uh, for starters, we might as well uh, get you to introduce yourself. And uh, yeah, who is Andy? <laughs> that, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> otherwise, I'm uh, my name is Andy. I host the, the podcast, The Poor Pearls Almanac. Uh, we're a podcast that's focused on if everyone on the left kind of agrees that the way we're living is unsustainable maybe we should start thinking about what comes after. And that's basically the premise of the podcast with a a very eco-focused lens of if we want to do things better, if we want to do things right, if uh, our consumption methods aren't sustainable, how do we we envision a a more ethical, uh, regenerative uh, world in the future? 
That's, uh, yeah, pretty important these days. Yeah, it feels like it with every passing day that uh, it, we're becoming more relevant for some reason or another, which is not a good thing. I didn't want to be right about it. No, hey, I kind of hope that things will actually get in, get better, but they continue going the wrong way. Yeah. So how long have you been doing uh, the show? We've been around for, uh, we'll be coming up on two years uh, this summer. Uh, actually, it might be around this time of year, two years ago. It was, it was early on in COVID. Uh, the conversation about the podcast had started before. Uh, my co-host and I um, were high school friends. Uh, a friend of ours died, and we were going to uh, the funeral down um, a couple thousand miles, well, a thousand miles away. And we were just sitting in the car talking, and he's like, you know, people would want to listen to this. And I'm like, I don't think anyone wants to hear me talk. <laughs> and... Um, then he got me thinking about it. I started kind of framing up what I wanted to do with the content. And I reached out to him and he's like, I said, what now? And uh, I was like, well, now I'm <laughs> invested. So we're doing this. And, you know, here we are. Yeah, yeah that's, that seems like that's a pretty common uh, start to podcasting. It's like two people just talking going, hey, this is pretty good. Somebody might want to listen to this. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. So you said you kind of cover things. In uh, a, a very eco-specific direction for the pro poor proles. Um, so, what kind of subjects do you cover specifically? So, uh, the the general idea started with basically like there's a, a specific framework that I personally um, feel that is really important to understand, and that we use that we can use that lens almost like a theory um, to understand how things relate to another, uh, one another, starting with this concept of complex system science, which is basically that nature operates in like highly specialized, decentralized ways. And that model has existed, whether in, uh, the plant community, um, or like a, your local biome, or even how humans have traditionally organized up until recent memory meaning, you know, the last couple thousand years. Um, and, and that provides us with a really interesting framework of how resilient communities have existed and understanding the basics of the ecology, complex system science. Um, we can kind of take what we can and uh, a history of various locations. Uh, we can kind of take those histories, uh, the ecological understanding and this framework of um, complex system science to say, okay, while the world that existed four or five, six thousand years ago doesn't exist today. And by no means is the idea like that we want to go back to living in, um, those conditions. But there's, mm. there's a, a sustainable component, um, and alternative ways of, uh, relating to the environment around us that are really important and can give us some, uh, a lens to, um, take the technology and the knowledge we have today that we didn't have 6,000 years ago and make a better, more resilient uh, world that's not driven on consumerism. Yeah, that's a good place to start, I think, is the elimination of consumerism, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's basically the idea is to think about the way that the landscape has historically been managed and the, the knowledge we have today and how does that pair with climate change and how do we prepare for a future where um, climate change is going to unravel things much more quickly than nature can naturally respond to it? And what is our role in assisting nature? You know, whether it's uh, tree species that are slow moving, um, making their way up to, to the further north where their climate zones where they can survive exist, but maybe those seeds can't travel that fast. What's our responsibility in those situations? Um, how does that relate to all the other things that those species relate to? Um, and how do we pair things like indigenous knowledge with um, the fact that the indigenous knowledge may no longer be appropriate for those locations anymore because of climate change? And like, there's right. no right answer but we should but if we have the tools we can kind of figure it out and it doesn't have to be perfect but um we need to at least start those conversations yeah and and like the the tools like the way that one lives in relation to the thing like the the ecosystem i guess is uh it's going to be different in different places right like and because they're different effects Exactly. So we have a series that we call the Pearl Models, which is um, basically looking at like picking, cherry picking indigenous 
uh, groups across the globe, not just in North America, but um, every we did an episode on Indigenous Ireland, um, the Western Ghats in India, uh, and just looking at different ways people have lived historically in their landscape. And, um, wow. you know, the idea isn't that like, oh, I'm from I- Ireland, I should, you know, do what they did, or I live where uh, the Wampanoag exists, so I should do what they did because the climate that was there is not going to be there in the future. Um, but we have to have this knowledge at least to kind of be a starting point and then to find some uh, resolution with uh, the folks whose uh, ancestral homes do continue to exist and be uh, colonized and all these other challenges that come with it. Um, so obviously a very simple and easy thing to digest and just spit out and <laughs> have a solution and move forward. Like I could, <laughs> right, I should yeah. just write like a hundred page book, call it a day. Right. Do a pamphlet. Yeah. You're good. Done. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Easy peasy. Yeah. That's, I think that's one of the main, uh, issues that seems to come up a lot is like, there is no simple solution to any of these problems that we're facing. Like we have to actually ha- have a communal kind of approach that actually takes the time to learn the right things. And, and, and I mean, that's also hard because climate change is rapidly increasing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, the, the nice thing about this conversation, in my opinion, is that I, the idea, I think of like a right answer existing, I think is not the point. Like there, there's a spectrum of things that will work. And, yeah. um, as long as we end up in that space, we can, we can be okay. And that's where I think, you know, I think about like things like um, a lot of stuff you see on social media around like land back and like cancel culture and all these different things. And it's um, these conversations need to exist in a place where people can improve and start thinking about, okay, we can't go to this very explicit, like on paper place that exists theoretically, but we have to live within the confines of the historical world and the conditions we live in under, uh, you know, late stage capitalism and whether or not that continues to exist, uh, what, what the right solutions are based on the people who live there. Because in reality, you know, you look around at your own community and if, if collapse happened today, just whatever, you know, just for, you know, right. suspend reality for a second. The people in your community are not all anarchists, leftists, communists, whatever. Like, like you, <laughs> no, you yeah. have to find some common ground and you have to be pragmatic about it. Like, I jokingly call myself like a pragmatic anarchist. And it's like, I, I mean that in a very literal way, though, because, right. um, you know, I, I think people generally understand that like uh, a foundational uh, understanding of like communal democracy and shared resource allocation in those types of conditions. Like, I, I don't think that scares anyone off or like turns off too many people. Um, right. But we need to be willing to accept people for not being perfect at the same time and having, and, and further like humbling ourselves to not assume that just because we all agree that we're right, that we are. I mean, that, that's, uh, one of the, I think, most damaging things on the left is that we tend to spend a lot of time, like, dogmatically uh, arguing about, like, this is the right answer to these solutions. And we can all agree, but that doesn't mean we're right. Uh, and that's, yeah. like, a really uncomfortable thing, I think, for a lot of people to just even acknowledge. Well, for sure. Yeah, like, when you think, of, like, and it's also, like, easy to say, uh yes we're not always going to be right, even if we have the consensus, right? But also, whether we actually act that way, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, <sighs> colonizers thought they were right. Exactly. Like, so, a lot of every person on Earth has probably thought they were mostly right about whatever they've done. And there have been some pretty bad and some pretty not smart people <laughs> that have existed. Uh, yeah, and and right. we have to humble ourselves a little bit about that, that we don't have the solutions and it's okay to not have them. That doesn't make you a bad person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important to reckon, like say, well, that doesn't mean that we will, you know, tolerate, you know, people harming other people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, you know, there's no need to like straw man that argument of being pragmatic, uh, which again, yeah. um, also happens on, uh, on social media quite a bit. And yes. it's not something I see spill out in a like real life and meat space. Um, 
And it's act- right. it, it, it is one of those things. Uh, I just recently had uh, the folks from It's Going Down on, and we were talking about like we we all were involved during like the Occupy days, and uh, we were talking a bit about how like part of the reason why the shit that happens on the can I swear on here? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, the shit that happens on social media happens is because that could never fly. In when you were like actually organizing, like in face to face, um, it, it just wouldn't happen. And, uh, there's a really important piece that is that, that face to face component that I think a lot of left organizing online doesn't really address. And, and I don't think that's necessarily just a left thing, but I think like a general, like people existing on the internet and not living with the repercussions of, uh, the, the things they do. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, I, I came out of the atheist community, the new atheist community, right? And uh, that was one of the things that you would see people who would be real trolls to each other online. And then you get even in an audio format, an actual discussion, and suddenly their tone changes completely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. Um, and that <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that I, I feel like we're starting to see a lot of um, various voices, especially on the eco left side of things, starting to address and saying that, Hey, we need to be in real spaces together because that's how you build community. Um, yeah. the internet is great and it connects a lot of people, but if you really want to make meaningful change, you have to go one step further. Yeah. Which has been really tough the last couple of yeah, years too. With absolutely. The pandemic. When it's been more important than ever. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you've seen the downslide of, uh, like, conspiratorial thinking and the increase of, like, just toxic behavior online. And uh, because of, like, this, the pandemic and the inability of for people to actually, like, get together. Yeah, it, it's been uh, it's been interesting. Um, I, I know, like, we came out with this podcast just as COVID um yeah, it, it kind of it worked out in a way because, like I said, uh, we had gone, our friend had passed in um last the october before the podcast and we had started talking about it started scripting some of the episodes and then like it was what february late february early march when covid really started shutting things down and we'd had like five episodes written but we hadn't recorded anything and then we just released a bunch of stuff like april may june and it was just like oh well this was like we were just talking about what if something like this happened and um you know it's just fortuitous that it kind of played out that way not not that I'm happy that COVID happened, but you know, <laughs> no. um, like it, it was, it, it was inevitable, and um, we were just, I guess, at the right place at the right time. Yeah, no, that, that's all right though. That's it's good that to have a voice like uh, t- helping people learn about what we can do in the future. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. Um, I mean, it, it's something that's really interesting. You do this thing, and I'm sure you've experienced this quite a bit. You make it, it's like this baby. You spend your time like in your studio, like recording and editing, and then you put it out into the world. And then you forget sometimes that like people come back and say like, Hey, I listened to that thing. And you're like, Oh, yeah. somebody really did. And, um, <laughs> that experience is really I don't, surreal, I guess you could say. Yeah. I'm lucky so far that I don't have that many people who listen. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I, I, uh, it's it's an interesting thing, like to create something and have people listen to it, and and then even to develop, like, because I'm I listen to a million podcasts, so that you develop those parasocial relationships with people you don't actually know, and yeah. it's it's a it's a strange phenomenon. Yeah, it absolutely is, and and then it gets weirder when you start like getting to know podcasts that you listened to. Um, right. And, like I've been a guest on a bunch of podcasts that I was like a fan of, uh, like the guys from Dixieland of the proletariat. Uh, it could happen here. Um, revolutionary left radio. And it's just, it's like very weird to like, then see the face, like actively reacting to the things you're saying. Uh, <laughs> it, it's very strange. Yeah. I, I, I listened to you. Uh, I heard about your show on uh, rev left radio and then, and then we are now, uh, comrades in the left signal boost TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. Um, so I guess you've had quite a, uh, an experience with, uh, gaining an audience and, and how has that changed the show or has it? Uh, it, the way it has is that I've taken it a little bit more seriously. 
um, you know, when we started, it was literally like I was an abandoned high school and I've been dragging my shitty equipment around like every apartment I'd lived in, houses I lived in for like 20 years. And then it was like, all right, well, I'm going to break it out and use it for this podcast. And like it barely worked. And then, you know, it was like, oh, we're getting like a lot of pl- it was when um, when we got asked to go be on It Could Happen Here. I was like, if people listen to that and then they go listen to our first episode, like that's going to be terrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then I had to go back and re-record a couple of the episodes and then re-edit all of them because I didn't know what I was doing when I was editing. Like I used to edit yeah. in analog. Like this is different. It's totally different. Yeah. Um, and yeah, between that and then like trying to put out weekly content just because, you know, when people start actually like giving you money to make content, it's just like, uh, you, you have to take it more seriously. It's just, yeah. I feel like it's weird not to. It's disrespectful yeah, sure. not to. <laughs> it feels that way. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, uh, I, I have a busy life. So sometimes I'm one or two days late with an episode. And it's like, uh, I feel like I've done something wrong. <laughs> yeah, you've let them down. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're waiting for this. They give me money. Yeah. <laughs> Why haven't I done the job? But. Uh, yeah, it's a surreal yeah. feeling. Yeah, for sure. So, I, I kind of want to get back to, like, the eco or the ecology thing sure. a little bit. Like, uh, I listen to a lot of. Uh, North American indigenous people's, uh, podcasts, uh, like well, I, by a lot, I mean three or four because <laughs> so, uh, but I, I'm often really interested in the approach that they, they take, uh, in relation to like the land and, and other species and, and like even plants and stuff. And like this kind of like communal, like communal relationship with actual land rather than this uh, dominance type mentality that we seem to have uh, that came out of Europe. Yeah. Uh, it's good. Oh, I was just going to say it's, it's, I, 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 w- I often wonder if there's a possibility for us to adopt something like that in the, you know, as going forward. Yeah. You know, this is something I, you know, I think being in the eco left space, there's like a lot of talk about things like land back because I think fundamentally like the, our, as long as, capitalism in america is still the the primary narrative of how marketplaces work um i I don't see how that could change no matter how loud Mm. uh popular vote is i mean you could look at like medicare for all where what is it 63 percent of people want it and like it's not even like discussed um like (laughs) still not gonna yeah (laughs) like if everyone was on even if 70 percent of people were on board with something like um some like pragmatic uh, position on like land stewardship and reciprocity with the land. Like there's no reason that government would give a shit, like frankly. Yeah. Um, that's true. And that's kind of my, my own personal opinion with like land back, or at least I guess like the, the internet perspective on land back, which is I think much more aggressive than what most, uh, indigenous groups are really looking for, which is just rec- recognition, um, and, uh, some kind of, uh, retribution in, in terms of like traditional land agreements that have been put, put in place by the government, um, which ha- they haven't honored and like right. should ri- rightfully so and legally so. Um, but like any, I think the idea of like, um, seeing a meaningful, uh, challenge to the way we live today can't happen as long as, uh, the, the country that exists today on the land that is the United States of America continues to exist uh, with the power and authority that it has on those spaces. Uh, the only time mm-hmm. I think we'll, any, we'll ever see anything realistically like that is when um, the powers of the United States have been challenged, which will, I think, inevitably happen with like climate change um, and the fact that like our military is just overstretched and our government, like we're watching like inflation happen in real time and the government not really having a solution for it. Um, you know, as all these pieces start to kind of like, you know, the wheels on the bus starting to fly off, uh, or like it better, like a tank, because it'll keep going for a long time, even if it looks like it shouldn't. Um, and, and it's not until that really kind of comes to head that I think any meaningful change will happen in that area. Not because I don't want it to, I just, that's my pragmatic right. opinion on it. Yeah. Like 
we often see like in Canada, we see like uh, appeals to the government to uh, even acknowledge like they have the truth and reconciliation thing that the the federal government keeps talking about. But it's often like just for, you know, to placate people so they stop protesting or they stop, you know, talking about it in the media so that they don't lose votes and that nothing ever changes. And I don't know like how in the current system we can actually enact that change. Like it, it, it can be, it can be quite a, 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 a de- I guess, depressing kind of idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> uh, that's fair. Um, like, I, I don't want to be like a total like downer about it, but I just, I mean, if we can't get something as simple in this country as like healthcare for people, uh, or like making it, seems, it so insulin yeah. doesn't kill people because they can't afford it. Um, like, I, I don't see the government doing anything meaningful around something like land back or, uh, rematriation with the land or, uh, reconstituting how we view things like stewardship with the land, uh, in a way that mm-hmm. makes any meaningful difference. Um, and if somebody, pro- uh, please, please, please prove me wrong. I, I want to be wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But I, that's just my, I've, I'm old enough that I, I'm totally disillusioned in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, I admire, uh, the people who are like holding their ground, uh, Against pipelines. And, yeah, and, such and, like, and that's a totally like, different animal um, because of the fact that, like, you can – people can use a lot of power in a small uh, space, especially right. um, with the infrastructure that a lot of organizers and especially, like, that type of work are capable of. Um, like, they are very good at what they do, and they are very good at knowing how to use the system uh, to the best that they can. Uh, and it's really incredible considering that, that our economic model is designed to make them like basically an ant and they can absolutely stop a train. And that, that's amazing. <laughs> but also that doesn't mean like there's a very wide difference between stopping a pipeline True. and like rematriation of the land. Actual. Yeah. 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 yeah um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I always think like in Canada, like a lot of our land isn't actually even like treaty land. It's all like Vancouver is on unceded territory. None of that belongs to like, that still belongs to the indigenous nations that live there. But how do you, how do you even deal with like the companies that claim they own it? And like the government with their claim of crown land, like, I don't even know how you start with like to actually re reallocate that into people's uh treat various tribes hands yeah and again that even assumes that like a majority of people would support it and you know i think a lot of people are that would be that there's so it's so easy to to make that uh or to weaponize what land back looks like um Mm -hmm. it would be so easy to do that i have a hard time seeing it being having a major majority support in the first place um, it's, it's a really messy and unfortunate situation. And that doesn't mean people don't push f- to try to make things better by any means. Um, but I, I, you know, right. I just, I just try to imagine like the ads we see today for like in defense of like using oil and coal and like, those are like objectively terrible. Like yeah. what can, you know, the idea of being like these, you know, well, you know, this, if we honor these trees or if we give up this unseated land, um, that means you have to move out of your home. Like who is going to say cool with that? You know, like it, it wouldn't take much right. to sell yeah. to the general public that this is a bad idea. And there's already a lot of people who believe that's the case. Exactly. Right? Like, so. Yeah. And for, for 99.9% of people talking about land back, that's not what it means. Um, right, unfortunately right. there are some people that will say that and they're mostly shit posters and trolls and stuff like that. But, um, uh, like for most people, that's not at all what it means. And unfortunately it'd be very easy to make that narrative. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it's, it's one of these things too. Like even the idea of, uh, getting away from oil and coal, like you have to like, we talk about a a just transition. Like you have to like give people something that they believe will be, you know, 
okay for their life. Like, because nobody wants to sacrifice their home and their car and their livelihood. And so we have to like kind of, we have to process that <laughs> before we can even like, which we should have been doing 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> like, I don't know how to, how to even like get people on board with action for against climate change. Like, yeah, money is a terrible drug. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of at a at a loss thinking about like how like I I work in the oil field. I work at a, a wastewater disposal facility. So we we take uh fluid in from oil drilling and other uh oil stuff uh, like production and we process it so that it can be uh put back into a, a, a disposal well. And it like just the culture around, like technically my job is like an environmental job. It's, it's to avoid, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, but, but even the culture around it, it's not an environmental job. It's an oil field job. Yeah. So it's, so it, yeah, like the whole culture around the oil field, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to get anybody to kind of even talk about climate change. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny, like around here, um, you know, if you talk to like hunters, uh, because I, I grew up pretty blue collar and I knew a lot of hunters and, um, you know, you talk to them, they're like, you know, uh, because the ground doesn't get cold like it used to, you have to deal with ticks earlier in the season for turkey season. I'm like, yeah, it's called climate change. And they're like, no, 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 it's not yeah. that. And I'm like, it's just getting warmer. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, That's interesting. yeah, like, it's yeah. like that there's a very real cultural, uh, so like the language choice that, uh, influences how we think about things and, um, very basic science has been weaponized. Um, and that's, For sure. you know, that was an ultimate, uh, consequence of climate change being dri uh, driven directly by capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think of like, uh, this last earth day. Uh, the, the tagline on the Earth Day website was invest in our planet. And I often like right off the hop, like as an anti-capitalist, <laughs> uh, that was a red flag to me. Like the investment thing, like they're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to like frame it as like a pro-capital kind of Earth. We can thing. consume our way out of this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It, it, it seems pretty backwards to me. Yeah, and for Earth Day. Yeah, and um, you know, that that has been the solution from uh, capitalism is to re reconfigure our economy in a way that somehow we can policy wonk our way through to make it so that we consume just not so much that uh, we we damage the planet for hundreds of thousands of years like how close can we get to that line without crossing over <laughs> is basically what they're trying to do and like yeah. if history has taught us anything like trying to 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 control people at that type of scale is i mean assuming that you actually even know where those lines are um is right. like impossible and that's like even best case scenario that capitalism can do the things it claims it can do and that doesn't address like <laughs> battery consumption and like all these other issues that come from green energy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah, like even those batteries, like uh, where's that lithium coming from? Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is all still uh, strip mined and it's all still damaging. And yeah. And you know, th yeah. like um, I, I had, I'd been talking recently about this, that like governments in a lot of ways love climate change. And that people take that and they're really surprised by it. But if you think about it, like it, I, while I may be an anarchist, I also subscribe heavily to like Marx's um, tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which because mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of logical sense. And basically the idea um, to make it very short is that it's very easy to be very profitable up front. And then as you get those early, you know, efficiencies, uh, it becomes harder and harder and costs more and more money to make smaller and smaller improvements. So the annual rate of profit or growth continues to shrink. That's why like mm -hmm. the stock market loves to invest in like the, the small markets because they have a lot of cap growth capacity while as, like your blue chip stocks only grow at, you know, four or five percent, uh, which is basically inflation plus what the market goes up annually through GDP. 
Um, and, and like it, we've seen it play out a number of times, but being in late stage capitalism, we've hit that point and we're starting to see those things unravel in our economy because of the fact there's nowhere for companies to scrimp some money to improve their margins. You know, they've, right. they've taken over third world countries. They've gutted pensions, which nobody noticed at first. They've been slowly whittling away at, uh, the working class in terms of the money that they have uh, as disposable income. And now there's just nothing left. Um, and what the green economy does is it basically says, Hey, everything we had before, we can throw it out the window. We're going to start all over again. Uh, so like in that sense, the green economy <laughs> is like the best gift governments could ever ask for to keep their economies right. going. Yeah. Yeah. It's good for investment. Yeah, it's, it's good abs- for capital. <laughs> and they have a, a huge excuse to be able to say the government needs to intervene and hand out this money to these companies so that they can right. make it so that you can live and not die in the climate co- collapse. And like, yeah, the, that's that, right won't work but they they think it will and it also like buys them some time to keep capitalism looking good do you think that they actually think that it will work or is it because it seems like i hear from lots of people and lots of books are written about how like a lot like we can't consume our way out of this green energy won't save us it uh, like but it's still always pushed as the solution like do they actually believe that it'll work i you know, I, I think that, you know, as much as we're talking about like a handful of people, there's probably a discrepancy of opinion. But I do believe that like people like Elon Musk genuinely believe it'll work. Um, people yeah. like Jeff Bezos, like the problem is, and this is something you don't experience unless you deal with people that are really wealthy, is when you end up in that kind of power, you are so used to being able to bully your way into being right that you assume that if this is something I really want, it's going to work. And I know better than everyone else that's telling me it's not because that's how they've existed their entire lives or their entire like careers where they've been at that <laughs> level. And so I, I genuinely believe that most people, and again, this even goes back to like what we were saying before about like, we assume we're right. Everyone assumes they're right. Like these people yeah. have been successful and they assume that success predicates that they know what they're talking about. Um, right. and that's what drives, I think a lot of the, the refusal to acknowledge that these things aren't working. Yeah. So Elon Musk actually believes the electric car, the Tesla will save the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually could see that. <laughs> yeah. Like you have to think about the ego of some of these people and the, the right. ability of them to throw money at things. You know, um, we're doing an episode in about a month and we just, uh, recorded it. Uh, a couple nights ago, um, and it's on uh, some things, some of the investments the uh, Gates Foundation has done in Africa around growing food, and it, it is exactly what we're talking about. That Bill Gates is willing to throw billions of dollars at uh, the programs that he's put in place, even though they've been massive failures, because he refuses to admit that he is wrong about something. And he yeah. believes that because he's made so much money, therefore he knows what's better for people. Therefore his way is the right way. And it's not because he's, I mean, he, he might be a bad person for other reasons, but, but <laughs> like you can be genuinely trying to do something good and do something absolutely fucking terrible at the same time. Yeah, uh, like that because you're wrong. Yeah, because you're wrong. <laughs> and like that is something that um like as much as it's fun to like, you know, eat the rich and blah blah blah, um like there are people that are fallible and um but genuinely may think they're doing good things. Um very yeah. rich people yeah. think that the markets have blessed them because they were right, not because they exploited people. Um, and of course there are people that are like, yeah, I'm a fucking shitty person that said if I didn't do it, <laughs> someone else would have done it. Uh, right, but yeah. like, I, I don't think if most people are good and like, I think as an, uh, an anarchist or a communist, the general consensus is that you are this thing because most people are good and want what's best for everyone else. Um, yeah. that includes people that happen to succeed, um, that they, they yeah. genuinely yeah. may believe that they, what they're doing is a good thing, even if it's not. Yeah, no, that's fair. I, I think like I've had lots of conversations with uh, like liberals and, and conservatives that that still like they they do believe that uh, like if you say, well, there shouldn't be billionaires, they still actually believe that like 
Those people earned that in some way, and they didn't get there through exploitation, but through ingenuity and, and good hard work and, and stuff like that. But Yeah, exactly. They're wrong, but they believe yeah, that. Yeah, and that doesn't make them bad people because they believe <laughs> no, that. No, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I, I guess we could go on to counter-propaganda, or I, I don't know if you have an opinion on uh, uh, when Bruce, the uh, the Buddhist who uh, set himself ablaze on the steps of the Supreme Court on Earth Day. Um, I I have I wrote a script for uh, for uh, the intro to one of these interviews, and and I'm hoping like I'm torn because I admire his commitment to. Uh, the cause, and I, 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 I believe that in his faith, he was doing something, you know, truly uh, value based and like uh, really important and profound. But also, I worry, I, I don't think that it has an impact with uh, those people in power. So it, I'm curious what your thoughts are. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty similar to what your opinion is. Um... If that's what he felt was the thing to do, then, like, I'm happy for him to express himself in the way he felt was best. Um, however, the government, the U.S. government simply doesn't give a shit what people think or want. Yeah. Um, like, it's, it's yeah. that simple. Um, and trying to appeal to an amoral organization like the U.S. government or corporations um, is objectively a, a losing battle. You're not going to appeal to their morals ever, period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they don't have it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, because it's, yeah, it's uh, not not based on whatever uh, pro uh, profit or uh, colonization, growth, you know? Yeah, it's, there's nothing to gain from, and like I said, um, I think most governments um, are happy about like climate change in many ways because of the fact that it is an excuse to to basically keep their economies going. Um, so, like, I, I don't doubt that we will see in the next decade or two decades um, what we what the government would consider like a significant transition uh, to a green economy. Um, that right. doesn't mean like our gas cars are going away or that our home heating oil is going away by any means. Uh, but just like fundamentally re rethinking about how certain things are done, uh, efficiency standards and things like that. And that goes into a much more complicated conversation about like uh, externalities around how efficiency is created um, that I don't think ever gets really addressed and is probably a little bit out of the scope of what I could talk about. Um, more <laughs> engineering fair. people could probably speak about it, but it, the idea is basically that energy is never free. Um, so right. no amount of externality or no amount of efficiency changes really is going to fundamentally change things. Um, plus, uh, what is it called? Um, um, J begins with a J something paradox, um, which is basically as things become cheaper, um, people use more of it. Um, so like they, oh, okay. they, uh, they look, they looked at like, um, like home heating. So as homes became more insulated and heating fuel came down, that average size of a house became bigger. They basically continued right. to consume as much, if not more because it was cheaper. Um, I think it was Jarvin's paradox. Um, okay. Uh, and it, basically that we are not good at actually taking advantage of efficiency improvements. We generally squander it away by just, utilizing the material more that makes me think of like uh what they used to say about uh, cars like or traffic like you can widen your highways but then more cars will just fill it up like you're always going to have the same amount of traffic or more exactly <laughs> like the same problems. same thing yeah javon's <laughs> paradox that's what it's called okay um okay. but yeah that's exactly it that um if you you know the same thing with like if you make the highways wider more people will drive to work um yeah. you know all you know Regardless, basically, we're going to do those things because of, um, you know, bigger structural reasons that reinforce these things. And it all comes back to, like, commodification and the fetishization of material goods and things like that that reinforce sure. a lot of this stuff. So, like, yeah. capital is never going to solve the problem, but it's going to try really hard to buy as much time as it can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I don't think it can buy us that much time. <laughs> and that's why we have a podcast. 
<laughs> That's right. All right. Well, let's move on to, I guess, counter propaganda. Now, for your counter propaganda, you have the idea of post scarcity around food, food systems. <clears throat> so I've always kind of been on under the impression, and I'm sure this is what you're addressing, that we actually do produce enough food to uh, feed, say, 10 billion people or something like that. Yeah. But it's a distribution issue is why we can't do it. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a bunch of different layers to this, uh, the issue of uh, surplus food in this country. Uh, but what I think gets missed, and like, this is not the problem of people that are like, we have enough food to feed everyone, we should. That's 100% true. However, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of arguments around the first thing being like, we waste food by feeding it to animals. Um, that food that goes to animals is non-grade. Uh, again, we're actually doing an episode that we've recently recorded on corn and how like we, people always talk about like corn fed cows, like all that corn should be feeding people. But usually that's the byproduct of the, of, I don't even want to say like the corn oil or vegetable oil industry because it's actually more multifaceted than that. Um, there, okay. there's like a, a number of products that come from corn and the part that can't go to anything else goes to animal feed. Um, so like, despite the fact that people will say like seven pounds of, uh, corn will feed one pound of cow. So like, therefore, why aren't we feeding seven times as many people? Well, corn, like the, the corn patty that they, pr like after all the oil and everything's expelled is basically like eating a brick. You don't want to eat that. And like our bodies mm -hmm. would really struggle to digest it. Um, so like yeah. the idea that we need to add more corn in that sense to our diet is fundamentally, um, a problem. Um, and like there, there's a, f a valid argument about the idea of like growing more food in those landscapes that isn't corn or dent corn specifically. But, um, also the reason why we do grow corn is really complicated and it has to do with basically the fact that corn is able to grow better and faster than any other plant on earth by a very large margin that we can eat. Okay. Um, and if you're interested, we're going to drop an episode in late uh, May on that. It's our 100th episode. It was my funnest one to research ever because nice. everyone gets like very uh, opinionated about corn. So if you're if you're opinionated <laughs> about corn, go listen. But um, th to circle back, like we have all these issues around like, how do we improve and increase our food uh, production and how it's given out? And yes, 100% people could be 100% fed by the food that is grown today. However, and this is a very big however, is that the way we produce food today is incredibly insustainable. And yeah. that yeah. has to go to how our fertilizers are produced uh, through what's called the Haber pr uh, process. Um, and basically what it is is a super energy intensive process that um, pulls nitrogen from the atmosphere and like a good amount of the gas on the earth that we use like more than many countries go specifically just to producing this fertilizer. So the idea that if we can grow this amount of food today, that we can continue to grow this amount of food is patently a problem. Like it's patently false. Like we can't. Uh, and that doesn't address things like soil fertility issues, climate change, and all these other issues that are kind of coming to head at the same time. So while we could do these yeah. things today, and I'm not saying we shouldn't by any means, we absolutely should be um, trying to make everyone be able to survive and thrive as much as we can. Um, but it's today we need to start thinking about what the food systems of the future look like. And in many cases, when we start talking about things like tree crops, those seeds that we need in 30 years need to be planted today. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where kind of what, what our project has been really focused on is like, all right, if this is what the world looks like in 30, 50, 75 years, what are the things that we'll say, why didn't we do this back then when we could? Right, and like, right. not that I have like an, you know, a crystal ball or the answer or anything like that, but at least it's starting the conversation and hopefully people smarter than me can pick up the mantle in the future and continue to like, hopefully disprove a bunch of stuff that I've said. I, what do you think of uh, like the idea that um, <clears throat> a lot of the things that we take for granted right now, like that we're getting out of season fruits uh, all across North America or all across the world 
uh, or, or sometimes we can get fruit from Africa shipped here and, and, and it can still be ripe. Um, like it, to me, that doesn't seem sustainable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wonder what you think of, of that. Like the idea that maybe like someday we won't be able to have coffee or we won't be able to have various products just because, uh, we can't ship it or we shouldn't, won't be shipping it. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's one of those things that I think if we were smart about it, we could continue to do that as a supplementary piece of our, uh, diet. But as mm. the fundamental foundation of our diet is not, and especially without us making any meaningful change in the near future, um, like that, that is going to end. Um, but it doesn't have to. Like as much as like right. I was kind of like shitting on the concept of like the green revolution being like this thing where it's like, how close can we get to not like being a problem for climate change? Like that, that reality is that there is a lot of gray area and what we could in terms of like CO2 and all the other uh, emissions um, release and still keep the climate viable. Um, and, and like, those are things that I think like we've, we've been to the top of the mountaintop, you know, like we can't, we've seen what's out there. We can't kind of go back. Uh, and mm. I, I don't want to, and I don't think anyone else does. Um, but we have to be realistic and practical about what that looks like. And that's where right. um, capital is very bad at like, judging those types of things especially with those externalities yeah well, well i guess like their main goal is profit exactly right? they're just looking at how much they're making this quarter and scaling <laughs> yeah know? and like scaling is the thing that is like fundamentally it flies in the face of most like natural ecosystems and sustainable development in any capacity whether it's how um, urban and suburban spaces have been developed or whether it's like massive monocrops and that's not to say like monocrops can't be done ethically and sustainably because like wild rice was car uh, harvested um, across square miles in places like the great lakes and it was done sustainably um but when that efficiency component comes into play is where we start to see um uh, like the the system kind of start to fall apart a little bit all right well that's interesting i <sighs> yeah what uh, I guess I, I was going to ask you about your, your contact information and everything, but then I thought, <laughs> what do you think of this, uh, the tra uh, possible transition into uh, lab grown meats? Like, is that viable? Is that a thing that's going to help out? I don't see how, um, like it still requires massive infrastructure. Uh, and again, right. a, like, you know, if you look at like a veggie burger, uh, most of that is like soy protein isolate and things like that. And soy is like basically the number two crop to corn. Um, mm. and that it's much like corn, a really good crop and it has a very important place in our diets. However, we don't need more of it in our diet, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes sense. It is pretty much added to everything at this point. Yeah. And like, I, you know, I get a lot, it's funny. I get a lot of shit from people about like, kind of dismissing a lot of the, the vegetarian arguments. And I was a vegetarian for 13 years. Um, so it's not like, I, okay. you know, I'm just like some guy that's eaten meat and like was looking for excuses to like justify doing <laughs> it. Like I, it was actually like the more I became connected to the landscape that it became more apparent to me that like what I was doing in terms of how I was living was more fundamentally out of line with what I believed. And uh, yeah. it was like, it was actually like very difficult, even when I was like, I agree I should eat meat to like actually like go and do that. Um, it was just like, because it had been so long. Yeah, I, I, grew, I live in a rural area and like I know a lot of farmers and, and uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether their way of doing things with like, like actually the area we live in still has community pastures in some areas. So, That's so awesome. like you yeah, you can actually still like just take turns putting your cows out <laughs> in the community pasture. So that's pretty neat. But yeah, I bet if you talk but, to those people about it and we're like, hey, you know what that's called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would not like that, but they would also say like they like the system. So yeah, it's yeah, all about language. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, the Red Scare has definitely made people really afraid of like the term communism. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we interviewed, um, we, yeah, we interviewed a dude, uh, who is a researcher up in Canada around 
uh, like farming and cooperative farming and things like that. Um, his name is Brian Dale. That's it. Dr. Brian Dale. Um, okay. but he is doing some really cool stuff and research around agriculture cooperatives and, uh, challenging some of those stereotypes and beliefs that exist in farming communities. Um, so I definitely would recommend reaching out to him if you are definitely. more interested in some of the agricultural stuff, because he knows Canada much better than I do. Uh, and he's done some really cool research on it. So I definitely it's awesome. 10 out of 10. Good guy. <laughs> right on. I will definitely look him up. <laughs> um, so I guess where can people find your content? Sure. So uh, we are anywhere you listen to podcasts. So if you're listening to this, you can find us there. We also are on Instagram, Poor Pearls Almanac, Facebook, Poor Pearls Almanac. We're on Twitter. Uh, we don't really ever use it, but it's the Poor Pearls. Uh, we're also on Twitch. We, we try to stream every week. We have a ton of guests on. Basically, it's um, a how-to series um, with different folks doing different stuff. So, like, last week we had someone talking about flower farming. The week before we had someone come on to talk about turkey hunting 101. Um, so basically wow. trying to create uh, a resource for people that are more entry level into a lot of the stuff we talk about where they can get some exposure, ask some questions. And then we put that up on a separate podcast called the poor pro Skillshare, um, which nice. is, uh, you know, it, it's different because you're listening to basically a, a Twitch stream with people asking questions and answering questions. Uh, but it, it's a cool thing and a resource that people like to have. Uh, and then we have our website, poorprolls.com, which is getting re uh, revamped, but it's got like links to our Patreon and all the other cool stuff that every podcast has. Right on. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really great chat. Man. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks so much. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical Corey. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves.